Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. It's another in the Student Exemplar series and today we're looking at a fantastic piece of work written by Krista. It's an analysis of Romeo and Juliet, Is Lord Capulet a Good Father? In Shakespeare's tragic play Romeo and Juliet, Lord Capulet is presented as a good father in contrast to the more cold-hearted patriarchs in Italy's 16th century society. The change we see in Capulet towards Juliet can be merely seen as a defence of his social status and unwillingness to submit to a female. Thus it can be connoted that Capulet is not a bad father, but a typical patriarch, even during the Elizabethan reign. So there's a nice introduction which um, allows Krista to explain her very complex idea here. I think, you know, the natural reaction might be to think that Lord Capulet is not a nice father, but actually Krista's thinking along different lines, and that's always good in English literature. In Act 1, Scene 2 of the play, Lord Capulet portrays a good, loving father. This is because he considers Juliet's youth and emotions before immediately marrying her off to the wealthy Count Paris. In fact, during the 16th century, the legal age for marriage was 12 years old, and the fact that Juliet is unmarried at 13 shows that Capulet sincerely cares for her feelings. Excluding social hierarchy and rather considering the patriarchal 16th century, the father would always arrange the marriage of the daughter on a basis of financial gain. Capulet's knowledge of the loveless nature of arranged marriage could be the reason for Juliet's preservation. Thus, by describing Juliet as the hopeful lady of his earth, not only does he convey that Juliet is his only child, but he further suggests that she is the only important thing left to him, explained by the several miscarriages the Capulets experienced, due to the fact that family name should be continued by her. The noun hope also conveys to the audience that Capulet has high ambitions for Juliet which ultimately, for a woman of Juliet's status, would be a good marriage. Through love of his child's innocence, Capulet has kindly extended Juliet's childhood, both of which would soon be ended by marriage. Furthermore, to a modern audience, Juliet's marriage would be perceived as abusive and exploitative. However, to a Shakespearean audience, it was rather a courtesy and created a positive perception of Lord Capulet. So what we've got in this opening paragraph, then, is the really nice interweaving of context, the historical context of when the play was set, and a little bit about modern context as well. Some very close language analysis, looking at the word hope, and some lovely turns of phrase. So I think that uh, one of the thing that I, things I really like is this. Through love of his child's innocence, Capulet has kindly extended Juliet's childhood. You know, I've been teaching this play for gosh, I don't know, 13, 14 years, and I've never thought of it that way, that actually, you know, he's he's delaying the marriage. He says to Paris, let two more summers with her. You know, let her get a little bit older before she marries. And, and because of that is, in, a, in essence, extending her childhood and her innocence. Very, very interesting. In Act 3, Scene 5 of the play, the audience sees a different side to Capulet through his threatening, aggressive behaviour towards Juliet. Hang, beg, starve, die in the streets, for by my soul I'll never acknowledge thee. Firstly, by presenting himself as hot-headed, Capulet contradicts the image by which he was perceived in Act 1, and this could suggest to the audience the insincerity of his character, further suggesting why the ancient grudge continued for so long. The plethoric use of lists of poverty-related verbs, such as hang, diminishes Juliet's power as a female, supporting the idea that women were nothing without men. To the modern audience, this conceptualises the patriarchal society. Contrastingly, however, Capulet, Capulet's antagonism could be but perceived as another mask to assert his superiority, as in the 16th century, being contradicted by a woman displayed the male as weak. Previously in Act 3, Scene 4 of the play, Capulet has just publicly confirmed to Paris that Juliet was to marry him in two days. Therefore, his anger towards Juliet's refusal could be merely for fear of humiliation. Although the verb hang was much more confounding to the Shakespeare audience as they would have commonly witnessed public hangings of criminals. Consequently, Capulet describes Juliet's actions as treasonous, just suggesting that he does not care for her life further contributing to the semantic field of death. So what Krista does here is explores alternative interpretations. And I think it's really important to point out that there is no one simple answer. So 
what Chris has taken some time to do here is look at really two conflicting ideas, but both of them are valid. And showing that you can interpret the text in more than one way is a very high level skill. I really like this paragraph because it almost addresses the thing that many of us would be thinking from the opening paragraph of this work. Okay, well, if he's so good, what about Act 3, Scene 5, that very famous, uh, you know, sort of, uh, disobedient wretch, hang the, I'll drag thee on a hurdle, all of that kind of uh, language. So by addressing that point, um, this helps the examiner, the reader, us to to see the uh, the sort of um, the the line of thought that the uh, the student Krista has. Overall, this is the climax of the play. Due to the heightened tension in the audience from the dram dramatic irony of Juliet already being married, it is possible that the audience actually sympathises with Capulet as a father. His unawareness of his daughter's marriage means that he's just acting on her disobedience. In fact, Juliet's marriage was initially arranged by Capulet just to distract his daughter from the grief on grievance of her dead cousin Tybalt. More dramatic irony, Juliet is actually mourning over Romeo's banishment. Therefore, Capulet can be portrayed as very caring, as Juliet's marriage arrangement to Paris were primarily aimed at making Juliet happy, and this reinforces the idea that Capulet is in fact a good father. So what do we see here? Really close knowledge of the play, and I liked in the last paragraph as well the reference to um, the um, prologue the reference to the ancient grudge. You know, knowing your play inside out is absolutely essential for the highest marks. And uh, knowing all of your literature texts really, really well is, is very important so that you can refer to other parts of the play. Of course, you don't get the play there in front of you, so it's not saying you need to know quotations for every single point, but so that you can refer to points in the play uh, with that sort of sophistication that is required for those highest marks. And this, of course, is some structure analysis pointing out that uh, this moment is the climax of the play and therefore what do we expect to happen in a climax and, and does it happen and, and that's all to do with structure analysis. Furthermore, Capulet can be seen to represent Jung's theory of archetypes. While posing as the archetypal, loving, protective father, he also displays a darker side through his character reversal in Act 3. Feminist literary critics, however, would argue that Capulet's oppressiveness towards his daughter was solely because of the social construct of gender, and so Capulet was just affirming his authority to the female whose sole societal function was to become a wife and mother, although it is possible that Capulet is a bad father due to his du duplicitous character. A Freudian reading would emphasise that in Act 1 Capulet was acting on behalf of his unconscious superego, which expresses the values and morals of society. However, in Act 3, Scene 5, he switches to the id, the part of the unconscious that wishes to immediately satisfy any urge it has. This could present Capulet as a good father, nevertheless as his behaviour would be explained by his pre-conscious desire to see his daughter wed. So what we see in this paragraph is the brilliant interweaving of lots of different approaches to studying literature. Now don't panic, this isn't essential at GCSE. This is more the sort of thing you'll do at A level. But I think it's important to realise that if you do have some ideas like this, if you happen to know some of these kinds of things and you can bring them in, then you know that's absolutely fine. In Act 4, Scene 5 of the play, the audience has already experienced the climax, and according to Freytag's Pyramid, the play is in falling action. In the discovery of Juliet's death, which contributes to the increasing dramatic irony in the audience, Capulet grieves along with his wife and the nurse. This shows, after all, that Capulet truly cared for Juliet, which converts his words, Die, I'll never acknowledge thee, into meaningless ones. This further emphasises the meaningless of Capulet's life without Juliet, which is supported by the fact that she was the only the only one to continue the family name. Capulet's sexualization and thus personification of death in the metaphor, flower as she was, deflowered by him, mirrors Juliet's words, death, not Romeo, take my maidenhead, in Act 3, Scene 2. This not only shows how connected the father and daughter were, but the horrid imagery of death having raped Juliet shows his horror at the event. To a modern audience, this statement would lack in meaning, although to a Shakespearean audience, the petty more, a small death, was a euphemism for sexual climax, and playwrights like Shakespeare liked to pun on the noun death. 
By extension, the repeated personification of death in the tricolon, death, in my son, death is my son-in-law, death is my heir, my daughter he hath wedded, contributes to the symbolic theme of mortality, but also represents his feeling of helplessness as a father, for all that happened was out of his control. This leads the audience to sympathise with Capulet unless they perceive him as self-centred due to the repetition of the possessive pronoun my. Although this could be his contrasting response to his previous words, I never acknowledge thee, which shows he is a good father, and his words before were entirely spoken in anger. It feels to me that this is a, a, a brilliant answer all the way through, but the last two paragraphs have taken it up a notch, and this has become an absolutely mind blowing answer. This paragraph we've just looked at is fantastic. It, it references such close knowledge of the text the context is so significant and i love the way that the sort of the contrast of the repetition of my might be the um the sort of uh, um, uh, response to i'll never acknowledge thee of course he is now acknowledging the my 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 so it's, it's absolutely fantastic and this paragraph in itself is is an is an amazing paragraph uh, amazing piece of writing the macabre image of death as the Grim Reaper was familiar to Shakespeare's Elizabethan audience and rather became an icon of European culture in the medieval period. This was possibly due to the plague. However, in this case, Capulet demonises death who took Juliet's life, which reflects the love he had for her. Overall, Capulet was a good father. He was merely a product of his time, which would have been more understood by a Shakespearean audience. Absolutely. Fantastic. So what a great answer. Now... I think a lot of you will look at this and think, well, that's just mind-blowing and I, I wouldn't be able to do that. But let's think about what Krista does. She references context, but doesn't just throw in a, let me show you that I know what was going on the t at the time, but drip feeds the context when it is an essential part of her answer and when understanding the context actually helps us to understand the text and the answer to the question. There's some great close word language analysis, analysis of structure and the themes and uh, alternative interpretations. It's an answer that really goes back and forth and says, well, you can see him as good, but perhaps you could think he was bad. And there's that conceptualized response, which is essentially, although there is evidence that he's a bad father, he's a great father. So really good answer. I hope you enjoyed it. And please do subscribe to the channel.